Hello, I'm Michael Cantrell, and you are listening to the Prison Officer Podcast, a place to have a conversation about the forgotten cops that work in this country's jails, prisons, and correctional centers. A place for me to try to make sense of a career spent working inside the fence with some of the greatest people that nobody sees or recognizes for the important job they do to keep this world safe. If you love this podcast, hit the follow button, or better yet, share with your family, friends, or coworkers. Hello, and welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Bronner Allen. But before we get to Bronner and his story, I just want to take a minute to thank one of our sponsors. During my 29 years in corrections, I've used or supervised Pepperball hundreds of times. Now, as a master instructor for Pepperball, I get to teach others about the versatility and effectiveness of the Pepperball system. Pepperball is always the first option in my correctional toolbox because I can quickly go from area saturation to direct impact with the non-lethal PAVA projectiles. And with impact ranges of 0 to 150 feet, Pepperball is perfect for cell extractions or fights on the rec yard. To learn more about Pepperball, go to www.pepperball.com or click the link below in today's show information guide. Hello and welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. Before we get started today, I just want to point out that if you have not yet, go back and listen to episode 73, All I Know is Corrections, my interview with Bronner Allen. Uh, This is episode 74, When Stress Tries to Kill You, and this is the second part of the interview that I had with Bronner Allen. Now, if you're going to watch this today, I just want to make you aware that we are going to discuss some tough topics. We're going to discuss suicide and depression and, uh, you know, how that affected Bronner. I thank him for being so honest, and I think this will really help a lot of people uh, to hear his story and how he got through it uh, with the support of the people around him. I do want to note that uh, if you are thinking about suicide or if anyone that you know is thinking about suicide, there is a national suicide hotline now, and that number is 988. So if you know of somebody or if you're thinking of suicide yourself, please reach out. Uh, and call that number and and get some help. Uh, We've had too many correctional officer suicides in this country, uh, not only recently, but over many, many years. It's something that has affected us at work and affects us today. But let's get on with uh, part two of the Bronner Island interview. Thank you. But I I knew what I was doing when, you know, uh, I got to Pollock and, uh, And then, then it, then it started. He was. Yeah. So tell me about Pollock. Cause for those of you that don't know, Pollock was, oh man, it was off the hook for years. Uh, when they opened up, they, they filled it with a lot of inmates that were very tough to control. Um, you guys had, uh, escapes down there. You had, uh, big fights. Uh, tell me about some of it and what you saw while you were there. Uh, my first day. You know, well, actually, it was kind of like, you know, my house on trip. I got down there and I saw pictures of Pollock. I saw pictures of Alexandria where I stayed at in Louisiana. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, man, this is nice. This is nice. And I get off the airport, get off the plane at the airport, and I walk out of the terminal to where, you know, I could see Alexandria. And I'm like going, oh, my God, this is not what the pictures look like. <laughs> you know, um, so I checked in my hotel and uh, remember I said, you know, uh, I'm a big Alabama fan and I got the name Bama yeah. and I went to this restaurant, chicken wing restaurant, and they wanted to serve me ice water because I had an Alabama shirt on. They were saying, this is LSU country, you know, get uh, prepared. So I'm like, oh man, I'm not even going to like this place. And I ain't wow. made it to the institution yet. And uh, so I go back to the hotel and I probably used five cans of uh, spray starch on my uniform to make sure that this thing was immaculate. And I yeah. get there. And uh, I walk around the USP and I saw the fences lined up. I'm like going, man, these are like cages on the outside, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's what it looked like. It looked like our wreck cages um, when you walk out in the yard because Pollock was so bad that, you know, they had actually put fences up to separate the inmates, the housing units. So you had sure. an A, a B, and a C. So the C yard was like the softball field. And then the B yard was your basketball courts and your handball courts. Then the A yard was the soccer field. And they, they would swap them. So A would have to walk to another fence, get to B. B would walk on another side, down another side of walk, get to A or whatever they were going that day. Mm-hmm. So I was like going, man, you guys got kind of like segregated this whole place. 
And luckily that first day you know, that I was making my house strip, nothing happened. It was quiet. You know, um, I walked around with a lieutenant and I can't, and I actually can't even remember his name. The first, that their first lieutenant. Um, cause I don't even think he was there when I got back. Hmm. And, uh, so I walked around and I'm like, Oh, like, this is pretty cool. And then I met, you know, warden, uh, Sherrod. Yeah. And, uh, that was an experience right there. Um, <laughs> we talked about top wardens. He was kind of like, you know, near the bottom there, mm-hmm. but, uh, not, not saying anything bad about him, but I just, you get that particular taste of people. Um, but then I went to the FCI and I walked around with the FCI with, uh, Lieutenant Havis and, uh, Havis was a great guy. He retired also. And, mm-hmm. uh, we walked around and I remember walking into a, to a, one of the units and the officer was on the phone. He's like going, Hey, I think a lieutenant's here. I'm kind of looking down at my bars and my shirt. I'm like going, yeah, I think that's what I am. I think I am. And I told him, I said, are you going to get off that phone? He's like, this is, yeah, hold on a minute. And he hangs up, hangs up the phone. And I'm like going, so how's your unit look? He actually put his hands on the desk, looked around, you know, outside his little vestibule and goes, it looks pretty good. And I'm like going, no, nah, man, I need you to get up. We're going to walk around the unit. Yeah. So we walked around the unit and, uh, he was like right in my pocket. And uh, so we get back and I tell Havis, I say, look, man, I think this officer is scared. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's like this. He says, yeah, he says, he says I think he's, he's it's going to be just a couple of days and he's going to be gone. And it, it sure was. It wasn't for him. He was he was scared. He he actually almost locked the door after I left, you know. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, it, it seemed like, oh, you know what? This seems all right. I think I'm going to be good yeah. here. Right. So then I go back home and I get everything packed up and move the park. And my first day, you know, I get there at about five o'clock in the morning. Shift starts at six. Mm-hmm. And the lieutenant's upset, upset at me because I'm there early. I'm like going, hey, you know, uh, I'm here to do my, uh, um, you know, get my detail censuses and all that stuff done. I like to get here early. He's like, well, I'm not paying you. I don't know, I'm going to clock you in at 545. I said, man, you do whatever you want to do. Right. You know, Bobby Bobby Ventura. And uh so Bobby was he was one of those those guys that he would get mad and then ten minutes later he'd come and apologize to you. So uh I did all my detail census and uh another great officer, uh Nicholas Tate, he's a lieutenant now, Pollock. Mm-hmm. And uh Tate comes in, he says, Hey, uh, oh you're the new lieutenant. I said, Yes, sir. I said, Lieutenant Allen. He's like, Oh, I'm Officer Tate. He said, You ready to do mainline, sir? I said, Yeah. So I start to walk out with him, and he says, uh, hey, you got to get that, the meal rotation. You know, for those that don't know what meal rotation is, you don't call everybody at one time. You know, you call, like, A1 or A2, let them get in there, eat, then call the next couple, and you just keep rotating. Once all A's out back in the unit, then you call the B, you know, unit, because you never want all those in at the same time. Sure. So I grabbed it. I asked Bobby, I said, hey, man, I said, uh, you got a meal rotation sheet. He says, oh, just let me stop doing what I'm doing so I can get your meal rotation sheet. I'm like, calm down. But he was using some some profound words. <laughs> so I was like going, man, you cuss at me one more time. One more time. <laughs> so he gives me the sheet. I said, thank you. And he's like this. He says, aren't you going to make me a, a effing copy? I'm like, well, that's it. I told Tay, I said, step out a minute. And I told him, I said, look, man, I said, this is my first day. It could be my last day. I said, this yeah. don't mean nothing to me. I said, you ever cuss at me again, so I'm going to punch you dead in your mouth. <laughs> and uh, I said, I'm going to make your copies for you. So I made the copies for him. And uh, he said, all right. And Tate's like going, give it five minutes, five minutes. I'm like, what is five minutes? And I'm mad now. I'm upset. <laughs> I said, I can't believe this lieutenant told me what he did. <laughs> and he comes in there. He says, hey, he says, uh, Lieutenant Allen, he says, let's let's start over. I'm, I'm Lieutenant Ventura. He says, I'm really sorry about what I said in there. He said, that's, that's wrong of me. And I said, man, it's okay. It's okay. So he said, all right, well, if you need anything, just let me know. And he goes, he leaves me in mainline. And uh, so we finished mainline. I actually do all my detail senses, which takes me about an hour or so. And I'm hot now. So I go back and I get a Dr. Pepper out of the machine. And as I open it up, the Dr. Pepper spores all over my uniform. And I'm going, oh my gosh, my first day. I said, now I got soda all over my uniform and luckily all that spray starch that i put on my shirt you know it just 
kind of repelled the Dr. Pepper. So I'm like, going, all right. right. Well, as I'm in the bathroom, they call a body alarm in a Bravo unit. Well, I take off running across this yard. And I mean, I was in good condition, I thought. And everybody's like running at a jog pace. And I'm just full speed. And they're all yelling me, slow down, Lieutenant, slow down. I'm like going, it's a body alarm. It's a body alarm. And I hit those steps. And I could not go up the steps. People were passing me saying, told you so then. I'm like, holy crap, I can't move my legs. And uh, I get up there and uh, um, inmate hit an officer. And then the officer hit the inmate. That was it. And uh, so we cuffed him up and we're taking him down the back stairwell. And this inmate bites me in the thigh. And I'm like going, oh, my God. (laughs) So my first day, I get yelled at by a lieutenant, cussed at. I get sold all my uniform and I get assaulted by an inmate. The very first day, I'm like going, man, I don't think I'm going to like this. And then uh, the next day, yeah, the next day, I'm like going, okay, I'm going to give it another day. <laughs> Just one more day. See, see how it goes. And uh, right. Warden Sherrod met me in the parking lot, and we were talking about He said, hey, so how was your first day? I heard you got assaulted. You all right? I said, yes, yeah. so I got a little bit of, you know, redness where the inmates' teeth are still, you know, showing on my thigh. And he's like, oh, I hate that happened to you. So he's like, I got something to show you. And I said, all right. So we go in his office. Well, the warden's briefing room. And they got mm-hmm. all these monitors. I've never been in. I actually never been, even been in the warden's briefing room. And sure. there's cameras everywhere. And, well, monitors. And there's, you see everywhere, the whole institution. He's like, I want you to sit down a minute. I want you to look at something. He says, you're a GS9 lieutenant. You've never been here before. He says, so that means you got fresh eyes. That's why I hired you. Fresh cool. eyes. I'm like going, okay. Cool. So we sit down. And I'm looking at these monitors, and he's like, look at this one right here. And we're looking at Unicor, and staff are standing there with their, their hands in their pockets. And inmates are walking through the metal detector. Lights are going off. People, Inmates are taking their bags. They're walking around the metal detector. He says, what do you see here? And I'm thinking to myself going, okay, you're a lieutenant now. You're not an officer. You, you go ahead uh-huh. and say something. Because <laughs> I was thinking that officer mentality going, man, I ain't telling you nothing. <laughs> Right. I said, well, sir, I said, I see the lights going off. So that means they have metal. He's like, that's exactly what they have. He said, the officers ain't doing anything about it. He said, I need you to go over and correct that. And I'm like going, right now? Yeah. <laughs> he says, yeah, right now. I said, you know, I'm only a nine lieutenant, right? He says, you're going to be an eight officer back at Butner if you don't do what I tell you to do. I'm like going, I said, all right. So I walk over there and the door opens up. And it's three Hispanic inmates coming out. I'm like, hey, where y'all going? And they're like, oh, we're going back to the unit. We're just waiting on a buddy. And at first, I'm thinking in my head going, you should be coming out this door. Right. And then I'm thinking going, well, I, yeah, I said, I, I, maybe I don't know. Maybe there is a movement called, you know, and you guys are going back to the unit. But, you know, I'm, like, I'm not sure. And all of a sudden, another inmate comes out, and they pull out knives, and they start stabbing this boy. And I didn't know what to do. I, I, I actually just, I stood there for a minute going, oh, my God, what just happened? Yeah. And uh, finally, I was like, going, yeah. hey, I need help. You know, also staff needs assistance. Inmates fighting, you know, and I'm trying to get as much detail. I got three Hispanic inmates. They got weapons. They're stabbing another inmate. And I mean, just going on and on. And they get there, and they lay their knives down. And uh, uh, inmate lived. I thought he was for sure dead. But he ended up living. Yeah. And uh, they took him away, and I'm like going, oh, my God, this is my first day here. And yeah. already seen, you know, a horrific, horrific stabbing. And then all day long, it seemed like, we got a buy alarm, buy alarm, staff needs assistance. You know, it, it just kept going on and on and on. Mm. And I'm like going, this is crazy. Yeah. I mean, what what I get myself into? And uh, so after it was all over, it was about lunchtime. One lieutenant came back, and they were like going, you all right? I said, yeah, I said, I'm good. They said, you look kind of, you know, you know, uh, flustered or, you know, wondering what you think you, you got yourself into. And I said, I, I said, I really don't. And uh-huh. uh, he was like going, he says, it's going to be all right. Yeah. You just got to go with the flow. Just come in here with a, with a strong mind, you know, a strong head. He says, you know, take care of your staff, make sure they go home. I said, well, hell, yeah. I want to make sure I go home too. <laughs> he says, uh, he says, take care of your staff and you'll go home. 
Right. And I said, all right. I said, I'll do that. And they're like, you're from, then they're like, oh, you're from Butner? I said, yeah. They said, we got another lieutenant here from Butner. And I said, who's that? They said, uh, Glenn McDonald. You know, he's off. He's been off the last couple of days. He'll, he'll be here tomorrow. He'll be your operations lieutenant tomorrow. Right. I said, man, I said, I know Glenn, which I only knew Glenn kind of real fast. I mean, I watched your podcast, you know, with him and he uh-huh. talked about, you know, Warden Johns and some other things. And I really did not know all about Glenn until watching your, your, your podcast. But yeah. I knew that he had a lot of experience when it came to the disturbance control team. And I was the gear officer. I used to get all the equipment to everybody. And I remember Randy Jones called me up, you know, and saying, this is why we're at Butner now. And uh, I, I think Glenn was a food service foreman over at the low, low security. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember Randy called me up and said, hey, I'm going to get you relieved. I got an officer, uh, Glenn uh, McDonald. He's going to meet you at the DCT building, issue him some equipment. He's going to be a new team member. So I was like, all right, cool. So I go over there and me and Glenn talked for probably about a half hour while I was issuing his gear. And he was telling me about all the, his experience with disturbance control and right. him being in the Marine Corps. And I thought, man, this guy's freaking awesome, you know? And it, then I really it, didn't see Glenn again, you yeah. know, because he never he never made it to the training because I guess that's when him and Warden Johns got into it and uh, he got off the team. Right. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> shit. But I was excited to see Glenn. When mm-hmm. you know he came up, and uh, so that next morning we actually had breakfast together, and then uh, we came into the institution. He actually came in early, and uh, it seemed like you know he set me his expectations, what he wanted me to do. Right. I'm like going, okay, wait a minute, hold on. But I was like going, hey, you. Te-, he said, I will teach you to be the best lieutenant the bureau can have. He said, if you listen right. to me, and uh, I'm like going, all right, I will. And I, I I made that promise, and I did pretty good. And uh, and then we had a, you know, he talked about, you know, uh, another officer, another lieutenant. Uh, oh man, this Gerald, yeah, this Gerald. And uh, he was my relieving activities lieutenant. He came at two o'clock, and uh, it was instant reports after instant reports. I'd have them stacked up like this tall, and. Uh, I'd have to do all these instant reports. Glenn made me do all those instant reports before I left. He said, you need to put all oh, those wow. in before you leave because you're not going to leave him mm-hmm. with all that stuff. Well, then me and Glenn argued a few bit and things got kind of, you know, strayed. And me and Glenn didn't talk that much anymore. Um, yes. It was kind of like, you know, two bulls going at it. You know, but I learned a lot from Glenn. Good. Was Glenn's office, I mean, you talk like – was anybody getting along in the lieutenant's office or was just the stress of it keeping you guys wound up or I think the stress, you know, um, you know, Glenn would always be telling me to be ready. And I think, you know, looking at it today, yeah. you know, looking back at the, at my career, I think Glenn was more like trying to say, I'm trying to get you prepared. I'm trying to make right. sure you have all your stuff done. So that way, if something does happen, your stuff's done. You don't have to worry about coming back and trying yeah. to play catch up. Right. You know, but I think it's how he, to me, I think it's how he told me to do it. You know, yeah. it's like going, hey, man, why don't you ask me or kind of sit down and, but then you're with Glenn. If Glenn's listening right now, Glenn's probably going, look, I'm not going to, you know, superficial anything. You know, what do you want me to hold your hand and tell you, hey, Lieutenant Allen, this is what I want you to do. Right. So um, I think that's what, Glenn was trying to do. He was trying to say, hey, I need you to do this. I need you to listen to me. And I think he was trying to be stern to me this whole time, saying that, okay, if I try to talk to you in a normal voice, you're probably not Mm going to get it. So let me explain it to you in the way I explain things. And I still admire Glenn. But Pollock, my first day, my first week, it was just running, 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 running. And, um, I kept my uniform always clean, my tie on, and uh, me and Donnie got Donnie got into it. I thought Donnie Cartrett was the best captain to ever work for. I wanted to be exactly like Donnie Cartrett. Yeah. And uh, the way he talked to inmates, I'm like going, I probably could never do that, but I want to be just like him. Sure. You know, I thought he was just, just awesome. The FCI was where I was used to running. 
I felt mm-hmm. more comfortable at the FCI than I did at any other place. Sure. And I could run that. I mean, I could tell everybody to go home and I thought I could run it. That's how mm-hmm. confident I was. And then we had a major disturbance on a uh, January the 13th and uh, it was, it changed everything. What year? Uh, 2013. Okay. And uh, it was, it was, I didn't think I was coming home. I was actually, yeah. you know, praying saying, dear Lord, please, you know, at least let me get, get through this. Don't let me die too bad. That was um, at the FCI or at the pen? That was the FCI. Okay. Tell um, me about six, that. 600 Hispanics decided they wanted to kill each other. Um, their thing was they, they were not going to hurt staff. Every, I don't know how that works, but 600 inmates said, okay, we're going to kill each other, but we're not going to kill staff or hurt staff. Right. We right. agree on that. And I remember we had just ordered, it was a Sunday, and we ordered a pizza for everybody, um, me and my activities attendant. And the pizza had just got there. And we had took around to the staff members and said, you know, hey, appreciate you all for coming in, you know, doing a good job. And mm-hmm. that's what we did as a lieutenant. You know, sure. um, I don't know if you guys did that when where you worked at, um, but that was the thing. We took care of staff on Sundays or, you know, holidays or whatever the case may be. But we did that. We cooked out mm-hmm. for them. But anyways, back to the, the, the disturbance. So that creates some calls and says, hey, you know, we got some Hispanics grouping up. So I said, okay. So me and uh, uh, another officer, uh, uh, Dakota, he just passed away not too long ago. I couldn't believe that. But uh, mm-hmm. So we walk out there in the rec yard and Brian Hunt, Brian Hunt was my compound officer. And yeah, inmates were, they were, they were kind of grouped up. So we went up to them and they were saying, hey, Lieutenant, you know, everything's good. I mean, right away, I'm like going, well, I didn't even ask you anything. So the Cody talked to him, you know, uh, he spoke fluent Spanish. And uh, the Cody was saying, hey, they, they just had some, you know, issues with certain inmates. You know, they're trying to figure out, you know, when they're going to bring them up to the Lieutenant's office, you know, to avoid any kind of confrontation and all that stuff. Who's going to go up? When they're going to come up? I'm like going, okay. So we wound up the next group, next group, next group. And it was always the same thing. You know, hey, everything's good. Everything's good. So we walked around the soccer field, which there's probably 300 of those inmates playing soccer. They love soccer. And uh, so we come back around and I ask one more time. I said, everything's good. And these Hispanics that were there, they were uh, a couple of the leaders. They were like going, everything's good, Lieutenant. Everything's good. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to worry about your staff. And I should have caught it right there. Yeah. When he said, I don't have to worry about my staff. So as I'm walking out, I get to the, just the metal detector as you come into recreation and the rec officer calls, got a fight, got a fight, got multiple fights, got multiple fights. And then boom, it just went crazy. I mean, you were holding on the fence as inmates are running by you and you're trying to grab inmates, throw them to the ground. And it was then we got some munitions in there, got some flash things, um, you know, and it felt like it took days to me sure. and probably sure. other officers to say, Hey, it's over with. But I think it was just a couple hours. And, uh, um, we got all the inmates in flex cuffs. They're all on the rec on the soccer field. Um, I think we had eight ambulances out front mm-hmm. taking inmates to the hospital. Um, it- did they just wear themselves out or were there uh, decisions that you guys made at that time that actually quelled that caused them to stop and separate or was it going on for so long that they, they got what they wanted done. So they, they quit. I think it was a little bit of all three. I think okay. it was, they were, they were, they were getting tired and they, they accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. And then with, with the strength of force that we were showing, um, okay. It, it 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 stopped it the use of force that we had you know with the flash bangs, we stopped a lot of inmates from we contained a lot of inmates right. from coming off the soccer field so we we actually stopped that from more inmates going into where you know because that happened on the handball court and uh so we have a fence in between the um soccer field then you got a fence that comes like kind of like this to where this is the basketball court and then this is the handball court, and you got like a vegetable that comes up. Mm-hmm. But then there's the soccer field. So all those we started locking the 
the basketball court up first because there was nobody over there except some white kids and you know a couple of black guys playing basketball and uh bocce ball mm-hmm. but um we stopped all those inmates coming off the soccer field and we were pet ball launchers we had gas we i mean we were just throwing everything we had i mean we went through a lot of stuff right and right. uh finally you know and i remember calling on my radio because i didn't know i mean this was crazy. I'm like, control, we need more staff. We need more staff. And right. I remember the control officer going, Lieutenant Allen, deep breath. And I remember hearing it in my, in my head. And she said, deep breath. She says, yeah. they're on the way. And she was so calm. Nice. And she was like, and she was telling me to calm down. And I actually, when she said that to me, you know, I took that deep breath and I'm like going, yeah. all right, everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. Staff are coming. Staff are coming. Yeah. And uh, I remember it got all over with, you know, um, and on the whole incident, we had a staff member. He was running from food service and tripped. Right. Before he even hit the rack yard and hurt his ankle. And uh, then another staff member, uh, he got lit up with pepper ball. Mm-hmm. I can't remember who had the pepper ball gun. I mean, <laughs> I might have <laughs> had it uh, at one time, but he got he got lit up on the side of the legs. And uh, so that was really the only injuries that we right. had, you know, um, no, I think I, an officer, uh, he got hit by a bocce ball in the shoulder, mm-hmm. but those were the only injuries that we had. Right. I would right. say five staff, maybe out of that five staff, two of them were actually, you know, hit by an inmate. Um, sure. But I think it was more like, get out of the way, you know, we're, we don't yep. want you involved. You know, I'm trying to get that inmate right there. Um, so it was no, and I felt good about it. I'm like going, okay, I'm still, you know, a hundred percent. I didn't get no staff hurt or killed during my watch. Yep. And that was my goal. And that was something that Teddy Moscar and, you know, uh, Ty rule. They always, they, they taught me that they said, go in there and make sure your staff go home. You know, mm-hmm. uh, you do what you got to do. Uh, take care of your staff. You know, yeah. most importantly, you know, and it's one of those things where we as all as lieutenant supervisors, you know, we get promoted. And I think what I can bomb, we talked about earlier with him saying, you got to go somewhere else. I think what it is, is sometimes we forget where we came from mm-hmm. and we're on that buddy system. If we're at the same institution to whereas if we're somewhere else, you know, you don't know how I, how I do things, you know. I'm not, you know, I don't hang out with you, you know, in the dorms and, you know, play cards and all that stuff. Right. Um, but the thing is, it's always, you know, we forget where we came from and we forget that we're now supervisors, but we also have to be leaders in that same aspect. We can't just be a supervisor. We have to lead by example. Sure. Um, and we had just had this discussion a couple of days ago um, at New Hanover. And it was that thing to where, you know, you got to stop being a supervisor. You got to be a leader. And this is in our, in our, in the sergeant's office, explain to them people. And uh, they're like, well, what do you, I said, you don't even know what I know. I right. said, but I'm trying to tell you right now that, you know, there's a difference between being a supervisor and being a leader. I said, sure. you know, if you want those, you got those bars, you got those starting strikes because you wanted power. So be it, but you'll yeah. never gain the respect of those officers. And that day on that rec yard, when that disturbance happened, officers were coming up saying, hey, thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you, Lieutenant. And, you know, that meant more to me than anything else in my career, that you have Mm -hmm. officers saying, hey, where are you going next quarter? You know, are you going to mornings? Are you going to days? And staff want to follow you. That's what makes you a good leader. And, you know, after that day, it seemed like that's what it was. Everybody wanted to go, you know, where I was going, you know. Um, but you had your few that said, Hey, I'd rather go. Cause every time Alan has a post, you know, we have a disturbance. I'm like, what well, it happened one time, you know, come on now. <laughs> but, uh, um, then they, they sent me back to, uh, the FCI after, you know, a few changes, you know, um, people, the inmates were escaping from the camp over there at Pollock. And, uh, so they, they said, we need a Lieutenant over there, you mm-hmm. know, just make your, you know, the executive officer at the time, she's like, I want a, I want a lieutenant. I want him assigned to the camp. And uh, I remember going to the camp 
and uh they said uh just make your own you know uh uh schedule they said you know maybe work a couple of days nights a couple of days evenings a couple of days during yeah. the you know morning so that way the inmate doesn't know when you're going to be there so i had my own office and i'd go in there and i work with the officers and everything and then uh um they sent me back to the usp which i thought was like thank you I'm going back to USP, you know, because right. I want to be a captain. And I said, I need that USP experience. I need to get that the rest of that USP in. And then, uh, of course, I watch your podcast. Li- well, listen to your podcast. That's and right. I think what you do is great. I appreciate that. And, um, you know, so I end my career at Poly. You know, I retired. Right. And uh, um, I had a great career. I couldn't get back home because all these, you know, 18 months or, you know, that I have to do before I could do anything. Sure. So I get back home, I retire and I go back to North Carolina and I'm sitting on the beach for six months, enjoying life. And everybody's dying. Everybody's committing suicide. Um, they're, um, when you they're say everybody, all, you mean people yeah, you've worked with people I work for people that retired, you know, even, yeah. even people I don't know, you know, right. so I started looking at it and they tell us that our average, life expectancy is what three years after we retire and i'm like going man i gotta go back to prison and my wife's like going you gotta do what i said i gotta go back to prison i said i I said i can't i I don't want to die right and she's like going what are you talking about so i showed her the emails and she's like go go work at walmart go work at home depot Lowe's, something i said i don't i I don't know how to react i mean if somebody talks to me in a in a in a derogative way or if someone you know um i can't explain it to her and uh so i tell her i'm like going i gotta go back to prison yeah because that's where you're comfortable yep it's all i know how to do um you know in in this job you know and and i was i was talking about we were talking about stress and everything else you know um back in 2017 uh captain uh john birmingham was there Mm-hmm. And uh, Lieutenant Oscar Mack, he, which he, he, I think he's a warden now too. Um, those were probably Oscar Mack is is my mentor. He's yeah. the one that taught me how to be a real lieutenant, and okay. you know I I admire him today. He he mm-hmm. he's just everything. And I remember the stress got me, and uh, I remember that uh, um, me and my wife got in this huge fight because she was still living in North Carolina. She says, I'm tired of being away from you because she'd been away from we've been separated for I mean away from each other for 10 years. Oh wow. You know, she had moved to me with me to Louisiana. She stayed in North Carolina. And I was just flying home all the time. And it got old and old. And we just got this big huge fight. And I was thinking myself going, you know what? I'm done. Hmm. And I had it all planned out. And uh I planned that, you know, I was gonna go to work get all my paperwork done, make sure everything was ready for the Lieutenant when he come in. Right. And I remember that, uh, um, I was going to go sign the books and the mobiles. And then I was going the armory. <laughs> and, uh, so I went out, I remember get all my paperwork done. I hadn't turned my computer on yet. And I went outside to do the mobiles. Cause in my mind, I kept thinking, going, you got to do it now. You got to do it now. Because you're going to change your mind. Something's going to happen. And control calls me and says, hey, you know, you got a phone call. So I go to the front lobby. I answer the phone call. And uh, it's uh, John Birmingham. He's like, oh, hey, what's in Allen? Uh, have you checked your email yet? And I said, no, sir. I said, I haven't. He, said, he says, check your email. He says, make sure this stuff gets passed on to your employees. And I'm like going, okay. So I go back out to, into my office, go back to the Sally Port, and it's on suicide. Hmm. Wow. You, yeah. Tell me. Wow. So I'm reading the email. I'm like going, okay, it's suicide awareness month. You know, talk to your staff, tell them the red flags, tell them everything. So I tell control, give me a conference call. So we're going through the conference call, and I'm talking. And nobody's saying a word. Right. It's just everything. To me, I don't know what I said. Everything was coming out. Uh-huh. And so I hung up the phone. And I said, uh, um, 
All right, now I'm going armory. Because I was frustrated at the same time because everything was coming out. All right. Phones were ringing off the hook. Hey, LT, you all right? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. Hey, man, how about you come back around? You know, we, we sit and talk. I'm like going, I'll make around later. They're like, nah, they man, come something. on. They knew come make around. Up. Yep, exactly. I said, I'll make around later. I said, I appreciate you, though. Yeah. So I get up by the desk. I go to the Sally Port. And Stephen DeSells, he's my control officer. He says, can't let you out. I said, what do you mean you can't let me out? I said, you know I'm the operations lieutenant. He said, man, I don't care who you are. He said, I'm not letting you out. He's like this. He says, uh, we'll take care of the Army later. I said, well, I got a couple of new count. He says, I'm a big boy. He says, I've been doing this a long time. He says, I'll do count. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, he said, I'll put your name on it. Yeah. I said, you know, this is bullshit, right? And he's like, it is what it is, Alan. Go make some rounds, man. Go talk to them staff. Right. So I went around, and I made about halfway around and talking to staff and staff saying, hey, you okay, Alan? You all right? And it, it was not lieutenant anymore. It was like Alan was on a personal basis. I said, why are y'all asking me if I'm okay? I'm good. They said, well, you sound yeah. kind of, you know, this and that. And then I hear Lieutenant Mack, Lieutenant Allen. I said, go ahead, Lieutenant. He's like, hey, 25, the operations office. So I go to the office, and him and Birmingham are in there. The sales called them immediately. Huh. And they were like, what's going on? And I just broke down. And uh, yeah. uh, Captain Birmingham goes, all right, look, here's the deal. He says, let's get online. And he got me a, a plane ticket and drove me to the airport. And Max like going, you ever think something stupid like that again? You see, you don't have to worry yeah. about going to the armory. Wow. And I and I was like, it's just the stress of this job, this everything that around you does to you. And uh so after that I became a really big advocate on the suicide watch. I mean, well, oh, suicide yeah. prevention and everything else, you know, and I stress it every single day. You know, know the people yeah. you work with, you know, yeah. know the red flags, know if they come in all the time joking and you know, smoking and now all of a sudden they're quiet today. Pull them aside, see if they're all right. I see even at home, and I tell this all the time, just because of this incident. And if it hadn't been for Birmingham, if it hadn't been for you know uh, Mac, hadn't been for Stephen DeSales, the control officer, who knows? Um, yeah. You know, I might have I might have chickened out at the end, but it was it was it was a bad it was a bad time. So yeah, it just was it was the stress that this job does to us. You know, um, it's it's unbelievable. And sure. a lot of people, and like I said, so when I was sitting on the beach that day, I'm like going, I got to go back to prison. I'm not going to, you know, uh, sit here and then have a heart attack or anything else. So my wife's like, so we're going back to Louisiana? I said, heck no, we're not going back to Louisiana. <laughs> I said, you know what? I said, I got an idea. I'm going to end my career where I started my career. Yeah. So I called up and I said, hey, look, I want to apply to the state prison. You know, but I want to come as a lieutenant. Mm -hmm. And the state prisons like North Carolina is like going, you must be out of your mind. You can't just come to stay as a lieutenant. You're going to have to work your way as an officer all the way back up. Oh, wow. I, said, well, I, I got the experience. And so I sent my the prerequisites of a GS-9 lieutenant and a GS-11 lieutenant. And they came back and they said, oh, my God, you qualify. You know, but there's cool. no lieutenant positions at New Hanover. Yeah. You know, there's a sergeant position. So I applied for it and they said, Well, come in as an officer, go to school, and as soon as your school gets done, we'll promote you a sergeant. Which they did. Right. And I've been a sergeant since. So I'm working on my but I started back as a sergeant at the state in March of two thousand twenty two. So mm -hmm. I'll be going on two years now back at the state. So when you went back to the state, did it feel right? Did you feel more comfortable? Did you feel uh, relief going back to work in corrections? I did. I, I mean, that sense of, you know, you know, I think at first my head was filled with all the knowledge that I had from the Bureau. Right. That, you know, I'm like going, hey, I'm going to make a big difference to come back to the state. You know, mm -hmm. these guys are, you know, still in, you know, the, the caveman days, you know. Yeah. So I felt really comfortable coming back. 
you okay. know, and then it seemed like I was hitting a brick wall every single time I turned the corner where I'd go, Hey, how come y'all ain't doing this? Okay. <laughs> They're like going, because we've always been doing this, you know, you know, nobody wants change. Nobody wants this and that. And so for, you know, that first five months I was working, I had to work this backyard and they told me, they said that I couldn't be around inmates because I wasn't certified. And I was thinking to myself going, you're kidding, right? I mean, I, I just spent 20, you know, almost 21 years in the bureau. I got six years with you guys, and now I'm not certified? They said, nope. They said, you know, you got to go back to school. I mean, I got OC on. I can't carry a baton because that's what the state has. State has OC, and they have batons. Yep. And uh, um, so I was, like, going, I can't work around inmates. They said, I said, but right. I got 200 inmates walking this backyard, past, walking past me every single day. And they're like going, yeah, but you can't be around inmates. So like, whatever. So, you know, I'm like going, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to hate this job again. You know, uh, I'm like, God. So uh, I said, there's, there's a work release building that's only got nine inmates in there. Those are janitors. Right. I can't go in there and work. They said, nope. I can't work the gatehouse. Nope. I'm like, all right, whatever. So I go to school, I graduate, and then I'm thinking myself going, hey, I got all this knowledge. I'm going to be top of my class, you know? Um, state state policy and bureau policy are totally different. It's, yeah. it's kind of the same, but it's not. And so what I was thinking was right is wrong. And I'm like going, okay, well, let me adjust everything. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wasn't at the bottom. I was probably maybe, I think we had 15 people in there. I was probably number three, yeah. you know, um, but I had the experience and the instructors thought that was great that, you know, they thought that me coming back, cause they talked to me. They said, why would you do that? I'm like, right. dude, I, I don't know what else to, to do. And they yeah. said, well, good luck, you know? Um, and they, they, they even said, they said, I, we think you'll be a great asset. So I come back and boom, a week later, I get my sergeant stripes. And now I think I got a little bit more say so in the matter, but yeah. you know, it's still a no. I mean, I've gone in there and said, Hey, warden, you know, I'm not trying to vent the wheel or, or, you know, change the style of the wheel, but maybe this will help. And the warden's right going, this ain't the bureau, Alan, yeah. you know, you're not a lieutenant yeah. no more. And I'm like going, well, I think it'll help. Like, nah, <laughs> it ain't going to help. And yeah. then, uh, this last year, everybody's been getting ACA accredited. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they came back and they're like, going, okay, you need chits to uh, check out equipment with, which they didn't have. They were just giving people keys and saying, here you go. And then wondering where the keys are at. Who's got yeah. these keys? Who's got those handcuffs? Who's got this? And I'm like, going, and I said it when I first got there. I said, y'all need to have a chit system to put on there. Well, ACA yeah. came back and said, hey, y'all got to start using chits. Sure. So I'm like going, see? So some of the stuff I tell y'all makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And they're like going, Alan, come on. I'm like, look, I can make you a whole list right now what we need fixed. I said, because I did program review. Right. You know, as a GS-11 lieutenant, we did that stuff. We sure. prepared for, for ACA, for, ACA. for OSHA. Yeah. And so I said, I know what I'm doing. I said, you know, I said, they sent us to Denver, Colorado to do this stuff. I said, yeah. you know, I've taken the classes. And they're like going, all right, well, maybe you could just uh, submit some paperwork and we'll see where it goes. <laughs> and I'm like, ah. So yeah. um, ACA's, get, we, we still have been accredited. There's some things that, you know, um, we need to do to uh, get that accreditation. Yeah. Um, but the CHIS system is now in effect. Um, good, they got little, good. they got little plastic ones, you know. That I'm like going, nah, you gotta have these metal ones. They're like going, come on, man, you only tell us we need chips. We went this far, you know. We'll order some new ones. I said, all right, well, I'm just, I'm just trying to tell you, these plastic ones get broken or this and that. Get a solid metal chip. Yeah. And I carry mine with me that I got from the bureau. And they're like going, what are those? I said, these are real chips. Yeah. These have my name on it, so if, you'll know if I have equipment. And uh, so yeah. it's it's a different different beast. Sure, sure. But uh, well, it's good. Um, 
So you're still working there. You're comfortable there. How are you doing um, mentally? How are you feeling? How's your mental wellness? Have you came around and understood some of what was going on with yourself back then? And Yeah. Um, me and my wife at the time, we're actually uh, divorced now. And, you know, mm-hmm. I got a, I got a new, new uh, uh, lady in my life and she's just wonderful. And, you know, she keeps me going. Um, yeah. You know, she's got two two kids. You know, I think you saw CJ come in here a minute ago. Yeah, um, yeah. He plays football. He wrestles. Um, Kate, and she just left for college. Um, she's nearing, I think, her. Well, she started in August. You know, so she's been in college. She's home for you know that Christmas break. Um, nice. She's doing. She's doing really, really good. She's going to be a nurse. Cool. Um, but my mom and dad, they live right down the road. Um, and. Uh, my dad, every time I come home and I talk, he, he wants to talk corrections, but at the same time, he don't want to hear nothing about corrections. Right. You know, I'm like going, well, damn, why'd you bring it up? So when um, you were, when you were having some of that stress going on and you were dealing with some of that, did you feel like you could go to him and that he would understand after being in it for all those years? Or I, I don't know. I mean, I've never, never dealt with um, that in my own life. To me, you know, I wanted to talk, but I think. You know, if I had said something to my dad, yeah. my dad would have drove off the park and ended my career right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, we do get very comfortable talking with the people around us. They become a family. They do. You know. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, I felt com- comfortable talking to, you know, Mr. Beeler. You know, you look at my past, you know, um, you know, Lieutenant, well, Warden Rule, you know, now, um, mm-hmm. Ty, you know, I felt comfortable talking to him. But at the time, it just seemed like, are they too busy to talk to me? Or, you know, um, you know, I felt as if, yeah. if I had made that phone call, you know, and said, I'm going through a problem, they probably uh-huh. would have stopped doing exactly what they were doing and said, hey, look, I'm on my way. Yep. And I think at the time, uh, Ty was in Miami, or he might have been, yeah, I think he was in Miami at the time. Yep. He was a warden down there. Um, I think with Mac, you know, and that's why I think Mac was so mad at me. Mm-hmm. Um, Oscar was like going, why didn't you pick up the phone and call me? You yeah. know, I, I, we'd have, we'd, we'd have talked John Birmingham. He was the same way. Me and him talked as he, as he got me home and he's like, are you sure you're going to be all right? I said, I'm, I'm fine. He said, well, let's get it's you on an this interesting, phone. It's an interesting viewpoint that I think, um, you need to, and we're talking about this, and there's other people that are going to want to hear it, but the fact that you thought that they were too busy or that, uh, you know, you didn't want to interrupt what was going on with them, yet I know those guys, and you're right. They uh, they would have absolutely, you know, drove right there if that's what you needed. Yeah. Um, and, and so would a hundred other people probably. Some of them that you don't even think about would have done that. So um, I don't know how we get that. Because you're not the only one I've ever talked to that says that. You know, I, I I wanted to keep it to myself. I didn't want it to become somebody else's problem. I didn't want, you know, to interrupt their life. And it, it's not an interruption of anybody else's life. It wouldn't be if I called you tomorrow and said, hey, I'm feeling this way. You know, you would absolutely take a, take your time to talk to me or listen to me or, yeah. or whatever it is I needed. And so how do we get that out there? How do we let each other know that that phone call is sometimes all it takes. Yeah, you know, and and I think about it. We, you know, you've had all this experience in the bureau, and you know, we have our ARTs, and I think that you know we should stress more on that. You know, to staff. Yeah. You know, um, maybe you know, like you know, the podcast now. You know, me saying what I said. You know, sure. it'll bring others out to say, hey, you know what? I had the same experience. You know, mm-hmm. um, but I actually talked to somebody, you know, and, and the thing is that if you look back at it, I did talk to people. I had right. a conference call and I'm explaining, hey, look, it's suicide, you know, awareness month. You know, we got to be aware of our red flags. And then I'll remember anything else Yeah, as I'm talking. And it's those staff that said, you know, because they, everybody, like I said, everybody got quiet and there was nothing. I said, all right, you all the good shit. I'll see you and want to see you. And I hung up the phone and boom, phone started ringing. Right. You know, hey, you all right? You all right? You all right? 
So in a way, I, I did ask for help. Yeah. But at yeah. the same time, you know, I'm like going, I didn't realize it. It's, it wasn't like I said, hey, I need help. Can you guys, yeah. you know, give me a call? You know, um, but I think like we had a Warren Holland. He was a, um, he worked in the Bureau and he was at the state when I got there. Mm-hmm. And I was still an officer. And we had run into each other a couple of times. And uh, he committed suicide at his house. Yeah. And I was supposed to go over, you know, the weekend prior. And uh, I had something come up. I mean, him say, hey, man, I said, I ain't gonna be able to make it over the house. And he was just having a little cookout. And at the time, nobody knew. Right. Uh-huh. And I go to work and they say, you know, uh, Officer Howland committed suicide last night, you know, um, took his life. And I'm like going, oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I know. And he, he, he didn't he didn't put no signs out yeah yeah you know um because and the sad thing is i probably if i think back on it i have known maybe as many as 20 but at least 15 staff over my 30 years in corrections who've committed suicide that's crazy you know we had a rec officer we're doing aca and he came in to do uh he was a rec supervisor and I won't say his name. Mm-hmm. He was rec supervisor, and he came in, cleared all ACA. They passed. He started his drive home, pulled over on the side of the road, and shot himself. Yeah. Um. Had already had gotten a letter from the warden, a letter for his wife, and then there was, like you said, there's probably about ten other ones that you know. Um. I remember. Uh. uh I don't know which prison it was, but a mobile. He mm-hmm. uh, got in his vehicle and drove around the corner of the perimeter, saw himself. Sure. You know, and, you know, you hear all this, and he did it on a day that the firing range was open, that they were doing ART. So the mobile, the other mobile didn't even realize. Yeah, yeah. He just kept going by. And then finally went and up and said, hey, man, I need a break. And it's interesting how many people, including, you know, you were thinking about it at work, that have actually come into work to do that you know um and, and is that because that's where we feel comfortable you know i i don't know but it has happened a lot over my career so yeah i mean you you think about it you know all of us you know all even off the suicide thing is the fact that sometimes i go to work just because i'm comfortable i don't i don't want to i'm bored at the house so yeah. like now we're uh we're we're so short staffed. Um, on Christmas Eve, it was just me and three officers watching four hundred inmates. Wow! So we're so 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 short staffed at the prison right now, and there's only one sergeant. And um, on night shift, we have three sergeants. And uh, I said, I told somebody the other day, I said, you know what? We really need to put this out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, I don't know how many, you know, um, North Carolina state employees watch your podcast, but we're all short all over the state of North Carolina and they're closing, right. they're closing, you know, uh, buildings down to where they're having less inmates or they're, they're closing some institutions down saying, Hey, we don't have enough staff to, to do this. Yeah. Um, and if you stay the, the officer's mentality today not talking bad about these guys, but in our day, we sucked it up. You know, we, we, we stayed over a couple hours and we we're back on our shift, you know, in six mm. hours, sure. these guys here, they, they have to stay over an hour. They're going to take the rest of the day off the next day off. <laughs> um, or they're going to say, Hey, I'm going to be about three hours late. I'm like going, you know, the beginning of the shift is the worst part of it. Yeah. You know, so I need you here for the beginning of the shift. If you want to take off at the end of the shift, so be it. Go ahead. And we've said it over and over again that, you know, this is crazy that it's, it's going to take somebody to get hurt for somebody to actually realize that we're this short. Yeah. And nobody wants to, to hear it, but it's all over the state. I mean, I was just looking at it's all over the, the, it's all the, over bureau. the country. I heard yeah. the bureau, you know, hey, look, we're, we're off on this. We're off on that. Yeah. Um, and we got people that they, they apply. But they can't pass a drug test or they can't pass, you know, their psychological or they find out that 
they got to work 12 hour shifts and they're like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not doing that. You know, right. and they, they stopped the inter- They stopped the process right there. They never show right. up. <laughs> but the officers that we a, have. I got an email the other day and I always get emails from people either, you know, looking to go into corrections or rookies. And I got one from a lady who was looking to go into corrections and she wanted me to tell her how she could go into corrections, but not have to work directly with inmates. <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. Nope. You know, uh, corrections is working with inmates. That's what we do. So yeah, it, it is. You know, and I wrote a book. You know that sometimes I'm afraid to publish because of the stuff that I said in it. Um, but it's it's the truth, and I get a lot of stuff from like corrections one. You know, yeah. um, and there's a lot of good good you know uh, authors out there. You know, and and former officers that that tell it how it is. And I used to use that in my conference calls to tell officers, hey, don't poke the bear, you know, yeah. officer safety first, you know. Um, and that was one of the things. You make this job the way you're, you make the job. You know, don't be like me. I'm not going to be like him. You know, um, we all have to be our own person. But as long as you come in here, give the inmate respect, he'll give it back to you. As long as sure. you're firm, fair, consistent, you're going to make it. Don't go in there, you know, being an asshole today and then tomorrow say, hey, did y'all see the football game last night? Yeah, it ain't going to work know. for you. It right. ain't going to work. Yeah. Um, but, you know, today's society, today's officers, you know, they want to hear it, but they don't want to hear it. Yeah. You know, um, you tell them, say, hey, look, man, I wouldn't tell you if I didn't know. You know, um, but it comes from experience. It comes from what I've seen, the homicides I've seen, the staff assaults that I've seen. You know, Glenn talked about that officer getting, you know, um, uh, assaulted really bad to where, you know, another lieutenant had to retire. You know, I was there mm-hmm. for that. I yeah. was there during that thing. I was at the FCI. We were coming out. They said, we have a staff assault at the USP. So, boom, we all get over there and they were um, taking them out by ambulance, you know, and um, I actually took over, helped out take, you know, the rest of the shift with Glenn. And, um, you know, we worked it, you know, and then, you know, Something the the bureau has the state doesn't have is we had those crisis management teams that came in to talk with us to say hey sure. you know you just went through a, a horrific you know ordeal is there anything that we could do to you, do to help you mm-hmm. you know the state doesn't have that right. um, and we just had a, it may get beat up really bad the other day and once again don't have enough staff so the inmates know where to hit these people. And, you know, it's going to be a little bit before that officer gets there. And then by the time the officer goes in and do his round in that unit, boom, there's this guy laying in the bathroom floor. Sure. So show, seeing pictures of that, you know, it kind of throws back at me like PTSD saying, well, wait a minute. You know, you just you thought you left that, you know, at, at yeah. a penitentiary. Now you're seeing it here. And the inmates know it. The inmates yeah. know where staff, where store staff. They know that, you know, stuff's coming over the, the over the fence every night, you know, because yep. we don't have the staff to watch it. Um, but that's the only drawback of what I'm at now. Um, I plan to do this for I think two more years. Yeah. You know, um, and then I'll retire again. And uh but go back to the beach. Yeah, <laughs> we'll do that and and actually try to do what you do. You know, yeah. um Maybe, you know, maybe be an advocate for the state, you know, um, walk around, you know, go to different places and say, these are my experiences. This is sure. this is what I know. Um, so what can I do to help better you, you know, yeah. in, in, in your job, in your training? Um, you know, listen to Glenn, listen to, you know, um Ty, listen to, you know, Art Beeler, who's, a, I guess he he's an advocate right now for the state. Sure. Um, he does a lot of that. That's what I'd like to do. Uh, yeah. You know, I'd like to be in that position where I could train staff to be better at what they do. Um, well, the I goal or the... A, yeah, I think this is a great step. Um, and I know that you, you definitely have a story. You have an experience that you're... Um, get that book written, you know, get it out there to where you can help some of these people because there's people who are interested in in hearing your side of that. And, um, you know, I don't have anything prepared, but in the show notes, I will, uh, I will put, uh, you know, suicide line 
uh, phone number in there and some information for people that need it. Uh, if you're listening to this, you know, go down to the information and, and click on those show notes and uh, we'll have some, we'll have some, um, uh, information for you. Uh, but reach out. I mean, that, that's what saved you and that people were yep. listening was that you had reached out. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think what you want to do with the advocacy is just great. It's needed. Um, and, um, uh, thank you. Thank yeah, you for telling I mean, your story so honestly. And thank you for listening. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where like with the EAP, you know, this, the play assistance program, all this stuff, I think it needs to be more out for people to, to, to see instead of just talking about it once a year. Um, sure. like with your podcast, you know, um, I definitely tell everybody, I say, Hey man, you got to listen to this guy, you know, and I'm not just saying it because you're, I'm talking to you right now, but I'm, I'm always on corrections one looking for different things. And I saw your podcast. I'm like, Oh, Hey, what is this? So I clicked yeah. on it and I started scrolling through it and I'm like, Oh, Hey, I bet these are some interesting, you know, stuff going on. Then I saw Glenn and I saw Mike and I'm like, going, yeah. Oh, I know them. I'm going to listen to this. <laughs> so then I started, I, I've listened to all your podcasts. Was like I think yeah, sixty four, right. sixty four of them or something like that. Yeah, yeah. This will um, be number seventy three when it comes out. So I, I think I got like sixty four. Yeah. Um, but I've listened to probably ninety percent. Then if I still got about yeah. you know ten more to go, to go. But you know your podcast, Glenn's podcast. I think there should be a a, a way to where we could introduce this to say, hey, go listen to these people talk. You know, yeah. listen to what Mike has to say. You know, he talks about officer safety. He talks about, you know, working a pose, you know, um, you know, inmate property, stuff like that. Yeah. Just just go through it, listen to him talk, you know, listen to Glenn talk, because Glenn has some good 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 pods. He does. Yep. And uh I've only listened to a few of his. Um of course I listen to him and Bobby talk. Um yeah. but I've listened to a couple of, of Glenn's and it's it's just so awesome that you got and Mike's out there doing his thing, oh, you yeah. know. Um, and I think that's good that you know we're doing that, and that's kind of like what I want to do. And maybe we need more of that. We need more, yeah. you know, these retirees come back out and saying, "Hey, look, let me tell you about real corrections. You guys yeah. got it made. You know, <laughs> um, all you guys got to do is come in here, and you're you're glorified babysitters. That's all you are." Just answer questions, make sure the inmates doing what they're supposed to do, you know, and get them out the door to work release and right. bam, make sure they go eat, make sure they come back, make sure they clean their stuff up. That's all you have to do. Yeah. That's it. You know, yeah. make it, you know, <laughs> with the experience that we all have, we've seen it go from zero to 60 and a drop of a dime, you know? Um, but I think that's what we need more of, you know, like you add in, the EA, the um suicide you know line that's great yep. i mean it, it it's it's awesome that just little things that we learn and listen to we could take and make it a better you know um issue Absolutely. and hopefully you know with this ACA going on i keep taking the state back on hey here's some <laughs> look these are audits that i did you know everything that you got right here you see where it says ACA and it's got a number those are ACA accreditation you know yeah so maybe oh, they'll, yeah. they'll they'll look at that and go, hey. But this is this is great talking to you, and, and I'm glad that you know I was able to see your podcast and yeah. you know actually want to sit there and talk to you about you know different things. Oh, it's been a great conversation. I appreciate it a lot. I want to see you get to work on that book. I yeah, want to I, mean, I want to read them stories you got. So. It's like you know, <laughs> this is there just a couple pages that I I took away. I think it's like you know this thick. Yeah. Um, so, but, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much for being on here and, uh, I appreciate it. And, uh, I look forward to talking to you again in the future. It's good oh, talking yes, to you, Bama. Thank you, man. Have a great day. You too. Before we go today, I'd like to take a minute to thank one of our sponsors. Omni real-time locating systems is a company that I've been working closely with. I'm proud to be part of this innovative team that has developed the best real-time locating system on the market for your jail or prison. Omni's PREA compliant real-time monitoring technology is the very best way to track and record the locations and interactions of all inmates and assets through every inch of your correctional facility. 
Imagine getting an alarm the second an escape happens, or being able to send a medical response the second an inmate's heart rate drops. To learn more about Omni, go to www.omnirtls.com. That's www.omnirtls.com. Omni Real-Time Locating System is the powerful tool designed specially for today's modern correctional facilities. If you haven't done so, please take a moment to like my podcast, or better yet, hit the subscribe button down there so that you'll be notified when the next po- when the next episode comes out. Have a great day. If you enjoy these podcasts, the best way to support the Prisoner Officer Podcast is to share these episodes with your friends or, or family on social media. Let me invite you to visit www.theprisonofficer.com. If you haven't already, check out the Prison Officer Podcast on Facebook and click that little follow button. Or leave us a message, or better yet, leave us a review. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google, or Spotify, please click the subscribe button. Till next time, I'm Mike Cantrell. Watch your back, and please take care of each other out there behind those walls. 